Hi, Mario. Hey, man. How you doing? Good. Hey, gentlemen. Um, hey. I've got one o'clock, or as I think you two are more familiar with, 1300 on the dot. 1300. Uh, so we will get started. Um, I see uh, some attendees starting to come in. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's um, NDPA webinar series with a discussion on open water safety. Um, I'm thrilled to be joined. I'm really actually excited for this topic. This is an area that NDPA has not focused on over the years, and it's an area that we uh, plan to give more focus to over the years. So I was fortunate enough to run into uh, the infamous Mario Vitone uh, a few weeks ago and uh, asked him if uh, he wanted to uh, take part in this webinar, given his expertise, and he was great enough <laughs> to not only agree to participate in the webinar, but also bring on Michael Carr uh, for today's discussion. Um, before we get started, I'd also like to thank D&D Technologies for sponsoring today's webinar. Um, today's going to be a little bit of a different format. If you've joined us for our previous webinars, um, we are going to keep this uh, to a straight discussion today uh, with two really high quality experts uh, on open water safety. So we're going to have a conversation as we go through. Attendees are reminded they could use the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen uh, to submit in any questions that you have as we go through our discussion. I will be monitoring those questions and I'll try to interject our attendee questions throughout the discussion. Um, if we uh, don't have a chance to interject, we'll try to get to it uh, towards the end of the webinar. So with that, I will pass it off to Michael Carr so he can introduce himself. I know both of you gentlemen have huge expertise and experience in open water safety. So instead of me reading your bio, I'll let you uh, give a little background on yourself. Yes, well, good morning, Adam. Thank you very much. So um, briefly, I spent 15 years in the US Coast Guard as a surface uh, officer and as a diver, went through Navy dive school and then um, served on a Coast Guard dive team for 10 years. I then um, left the Coast Guard, served in the Merchant Marine for a number of years, and then went into the US Army watercraft field where I served 15 years as an Army watercraft master uh, doing missions throughout the world. Um, and then I retired a few years ago. Now I live in Florida. Oh, very lucky. Yeah. <laughs> uh, most of the time lucky, June through November, sometimes people, you know, hurricane season, but whatever. I'm still here today, so. <laughs> That's great. Thanks for joining us, Michael. You're welcome. And Mario. Hey, how you doing, Adam? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. Um, Michael went soft on himself. He's, uh, he's certainly uh, the best and safest, or at least, at least his safety management system expertise when it comes to operating a boat is as second to no one else I know. And so, uh, He's, he's going to go easy on himself and his expertise, but he is quite simply the finest vessel operator I've ever met. And I've, I've met a few. Uh, so that's it. My, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Mario Vittoni. Uh, I am currently the uh, general manager of a company called Life Saving Systems that makes offshore helicopter. It makes rescue gear and survival gear for uh, coast guards and municipal operators for, for, for use in the maritime environment. Before that, I was in the U.S. Coast Guard as an accident investigator um, in Norfolk, Virginia. Before that, most of my adult life, I was a helicopter rescue swimmer for the U.S. Coast Guard uh, and did that job uh, and the U.S. Navy for a total of 22 years uh, before I, I got out. And and that I you know that experience would gave me some real uh, solid exposure to the things that go wrong at sea, uh, the investigator job. Uh, helped me learn how to stop those things from going wrong. Uh, and now I, 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 I help the rescuers with the equipment they use to, to respond to the emergencies. Excellent. Um, well, thank you, Mario. I know you have a long history with NDPA and you've uh, spoken at our conference multiple times. Uh, so thank you uh, for coming here today and agreeing to share uh, your expertise. And Michael, same to you. Um, I want to start off the discussion. I know, Michael, you sent some talking points in. Um, prior to uh, today's webinar, and I uh, kind of circulated a list of questions that I had. Um, you know, my first question kind of dealt with, um, you know, we, you know, a lot of people start off in pools, and then they eventually in their lives transition at some point into open water. And, you know, I, I really think we need to 
spend a little bit of time talking what a novice who maybe hasn't been around open water that much or maybe hasn't been on a boat should know before they go out and do this. And I, uh, Michael, I'm going to refer to your talking points. You know, your first one was we cannot predict the future. So um, do you want to expand on that a little bit and um, talk a little bit about what a novice should know around open water? Yes, I, th that's great. I'd love to. And I'll uh, try not to take up too much time. I would like to tell a really quick story to sort of set the tone. Uh, when I was in my early 20s, I went through Navy dive school and uh, some of the training was uh, initially was in the uh, river and, and um, waters that were confined and some was in the pool. And the first thing the Navy chiefs who were the instructors said to us is when we were in the pool or even in the rivers, do not touch the side of the pool. Do not swim up in the bank of the river. The ocean has no sides to it. You get into trouble, you can't stand up, you can't go to the side. And I I think what happens is we start out in pools, as you mentioned, and we build this habit of we get a little uncomfortable or we get a little uh, um, nervous and we go to the side of the pool and it's the wrong habit. And then we get into open water and we, we think if we get into trouble, there's going to be something there we can grab onto that will give us time to regroup. Um, so pools are not a good preparation for open water unless you realize that I got to be able to survive in the deep end on my own without anything there to uh, uh, help me. Absolutely. Mario, do you have anything to add into the, to yeah. Michael's point? Yeah, I think, you know, we, uh, we've talked about earlier the difference between pools and open water, uh, besides the obvious ones, are, are that, it, it, and I think it's about scale and size. You know, it, it's, uh, you know, people don't understand how far things are. They don't understand how big the ocean, the open water is. So just swimming off the beach, um, or when someone falls off a boat and they can think they can swim to shore, you know, you have to understand the distance uh, that that's associated with the open water. And that, you know, if your if your head's above the water and your eyes are then six inches above the water, the horizon is 800 yards away. That that that's how far the horizon is. So if you can just barely make out the beach on the horizon, that's an 800 yard swim. You know, and so and, and thinking that you can make it because it's just right over there is about you know something you don't often do, you never do in pools, is really judging the distance and, and the scale of the, of the problem. Um, so uh, I think the first thing I want people who are doing their first time on boats or the first time on uh, just swimming out in the ocean or open water is to realize the complete difference uh, of the environment. It is not anything, you, pool water doesn't move. It doesn't have a current. It's usually a stable temperature. It doesn't have the same size that you're used to. So with the, besides the fact that they're both wet, everything else is different. And uh, just, just realize the, the risks that are involved uh, and the difference between your ability to handle yourself in, in a nice clear pool and out in the middle of a lake, river, stream, or open ocean. So if I'm a parent who's going to get ready to take my family out, for you know a weekend at the beach or maybe we're going out um you know on a, a lake or into the ocean on a boat what are some sta safety steps that you think should be front of mind for for that type of uh, experience yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Mario. talk about boats mike you gotta talk about yeah that. well you know i think you have to analyze what you're going to do and i I'm speaking some in sort of a military approach to things, but if you're going to go to a lake, for example, you got to say to yourself, are we just swimming off the beach or are we going to be using boats and what kind of boats are we going to be using? And as Mario mentioned, are we going far from the beach because the wind and current, and, um, these environmental factors uh, you'll be subject to when in a pool, you don't have any of that. So if your family doesn't have any experience with boats or paddle boards or kayaks or whatever, I don't think you should just say, oh, this is benign and we'll just jump into it. You should probably take the time to research it and see what skills are involved. You know, before you rent a kayak, you probably should understand the, the possibility that it would capsize and can you do an Eskimo roll or can you get out of the kayak if it turns over? Maybe it's not the best boat to use for, for a family that's not necessarily water oriented. Um, and then, so that's a synopsis, you know, an approach I take. But I'd also add, we have preconceived ideas of what we want to have happen. We work all day at our job, all week. We got this family vacation. We have these high expectations. Oh, we're going to go have fun. Uh, and then we don't, we, we don't want to 
ruin that expectation by saying, oh, now we have to do some sort of risk assessment or we have to temper our expectations, which I, th I think we really need to do. You, often you might say this is not really the safest thing to do and accept that, um, but it's difficult to do. Society puts a lot of pressure on you to um, sometimes do more than you really should. Yeah, and that's an that's an that's an overreaching principle. The expectation thing Mike talked about, about you know you're, you 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 end up you know you have a plan in your head with how the day is going to go, and when that changes, your mind tries to map to the plan you had, and and particularly for for parents on shore or for anyone on shore looking out to open water, is you have this mental model of what a day at the beach is, and not necessarily what a bad day at the beach is, particularly if you're new to it, and and therefore you you. You misinterpret uh, signals from the water as as mapping to your plan of a good day at the beach, and and the obvious thing that people are going to say, I'll just get it out of the way now, because I I know the most common thing is just wear your life jacket, okay? You know, besides you want to be a strong swimmer before you enter open water, and you want to have some standard by which you judge what strong swimming is. My idea of strong swimming and someone else's are are going to be different. Um, but the, the obvious answer, well, you just put a life jacket on. And I think what that does, uh, we say that too much. It's not the, it's not the only answer. It's not, the, it's not a solution. It's one of the tools that leads to the solution. Every year, the Coast Guard puts out boating, the boating statistics, the boating safety stats. And every year, somewhere between 15 to 20 percent, depending on the year, of the people who drowned offshore do so while wearing a life jacket. So it's not a cure. It's not you can drown in a life jacket. It doesn't solve the problem completely because there's other factors involved. And so I, I think the most important thing is just to realize if you're a novice, that you're a novice and that your experience also, if all your experience was good days, doesn't matter or pray for a bad day. Yeah, you know, Adam, I'd, I'd add something to what Mario said, which is um, important. I mean, it, it dovetails what he said is when you put on a life jacket, and these days there's so many life jackets in terms of size and variety and fit that there's no reason why you can't find one that's comfortable and it fits. It, it also starts you thinking about the fact that, oh, I've got a life jacket on, there's a risk involved, I've gotta be thinking about what's going on. It sets you your mental model up to say, okay, I'm in a different environment than I'm normally in. And I think that, that helps because many times if you just run into the ocean thinking everything's fine, it's like the pool, and then there's waves and currents and salt water in your face, you're shocked by the fact that it's not like the swimming pool and you're, you get overwhelmed with the environment um, very quickly. Yeah. Um, I wanna, we're gonna come back to uh, life jackets and, and personal flotation devices here in a minute, but um, you know, Mario said something that I wanna um, uh, explore a little bit more deeply. And I've heard a lot in the water safety and drowning prevention community over the past few years is trying to define water competency. And one of my personal hangups with this goal of defining water competency is it's one thing to define water competency when you're in an 85 degree pool that doesn't have a current where there's lifeguards. Um, you know, can, can we define what a water competency would be for an open water environment? And, you know, obviously that's going to change given water temperature, moving currents, things like that. But in your experience, you know, um, has any of the um, uh, organizations you worked with or the Coast Guard, the Army, the Navy, have they defined a water competency or what do you personally feel a water competency would look like for someone in open water? Well, the Coast Guard has one. Sorry, Mike. The, the Coast Guard has one. The Navy has one. They have standards that you have to meet just to, to be in. They're they're pretty weak. Mm -hmm. You know, you can swim a hundred yards with your clothes on, or you know, five hundred yards with your flight suit and boots on. Then you know you're good. Um, it doesn't take into account water temp. They're not going to make you swim in cold water for very long. They're not going to you know. Uh, and so, so you can, but the standards are all arbitrary, really. Even much like the hypothermia chart, it's an arbitrary chart for when you're gonna cool off. The standards for swimming competency are always going to be arbitrary. The ocean's tougher than all of us and can get all of us on a long enough timeline. So it's a personal, it, it's, you're not gonna like the answer, Adam. I don't think you can. I think you can set one and call it a standard, but it's just gonna be one of many uh, standards for what a competent swimmer is. I know that my parents send me to swimming lessons as a young kid. You know, 
Mm-hmm. Five years old, learning, you know, kick on the side of the pool, and then we're struggling, then we're on swim team. And by the time we were nine, you know, we're on swim team, and so we can swim. And so we'd go to the beach at Ocean City, Maryland, and we'd go out in the waves and do things that I would not let a nine-year-old do now. I survived it, but I got better at being in the ocean by being in the ocean and getting my nine-year-old butt handed to me in waves and getting torn up and the wind knocked out of me and learning not to panic, you know, the really hard way. Um, Was I ready for it? You you can't, because I made it, I guess I was ready, but that's not the way, that's not the way it worked. I don't, I don't think you can set a standard that's going to be meaningful. Um, uh, Certainly a kid that can swim 500 yards without stopping is better in the water than a kid who can swim a hundred yards in the water. But none of that matters if you get stung by a man of war and he can't move his leg. So, uh, it's it's a it's it's too varied an environment to set a standard for. I think. I agree with you completely on that. Yeah, Adam, I can add to what Mario said. Um, well, I I've taught a lot of ocean survival classes for the Army, and then when I was um, working for a couple of Merchant Marine um, training institutes, and one of the things I did, especially in the Army, was uh, you get a lot of young, fit soldiers that you know can do ruck marches and fast rope out of helos and do all kinds of crazy stuff. And so they think that in the pool, they should, by an extension of those other competencies, they would be good in the water. And so one of the things I would do when I was teaching ocean survival is I'd make them get in the pool with all the gear on and tread water for 10 minutes with a stopwatch, which seems like a short period of time. But when you got all your battle rattle on and your uniform and your boots, and you're trying to shed that and tread water, 10, 10 minutes is a long time, and they would become exhausted. Then I would say, okay, next thing I'm going to do is turn off the lights. I'm going to make it pitch black in here, and I'm going to tread water for another 10 minutes. And by the time that 20 minutes was over with, they, they all were, you know, very anxious to get to the side of the pool and, like, think this over. Um, and so that was in a pool environment. And so I, I realized that sometimes in order to get people to a competence level, you have to make them initially uncomfortable, just a little bit uncomfortable, maybe a little more uncomfortable. So they internalize and they accept the fact that I'm in a pool and I'm not feeling really good. And there's some guy on the side that's going to save me if things go bad. What the heck would I do in open water? Um, So it takes, I think, a qualified instructor or someone with insight in the training process. And Mario is exactly right. You could get Mark Spitz swimming, you know, a mile in the pool and Sure, he's got competency, but you know you should, could throw Mark Spitz in the open ocean, and he might not survive because it's it's totally different. Water is not necessarily water in every place. Um, so, excellent. Um, so, in your experience, you know, what do you feel that people most overlook or maybe underestimate about their safety in open water? Cold water. Cold yeah. water. Yeah, quickly, I said that. Yeah. <laughs> Water temperature. It is. It is the most. It is the most misunderstood thing in in maritime, in in, in aquatics, um, and 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 pool swimmers and athletic swimmers uh, who aren't exposed to it misunderstand it more than anybody because their experience is that they get in the water and they swim well, and and when you drop that water below say and like what's cold water so below say sixty degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you, water and cold water are not the same thing. Uh, and the, the, the physiological effects on you are uh, not uh, at all the same thing. And so that, that is the most misunderstood thing. The number of 19 year old half drunk kids who decide to swim across the river, uh, just Hampton Roads, which is sneakily some of the coldest open water in the U S between December and February. Um, the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay is 39 degrees. It's tied with Woods Hole Mass uh, for water temp. And they'll go out in the Elizabeth River and try and swim across from Norfolk to Portsmouth because it's not that far and they can do it. But they get in the water, it's 58 degrees, and now we're on a search looking for them because they didn't make it. Um, so that, that water temperature is the most under, misunderstood variable uh, in, in open water aquatics for sure. Yeah, you know, Adam, I really want to 
second what Mario said. He's exactly right. And I'll give you the, the military analysis of this. So the, the military, yeah, the military has all these high tech super training programs for army rangers and green berets and Delta force and above and beyond. Uh, so air force pararescue, but the one training program that's above and beyond all of them and, and tests you and the hardest is what the Navy does out in Coronado, California at the BUDS, the basic underwater demolition or SEAL training because the water off of San Diego is cold year round and it is cold water, as Mario said, it is cold water that will sap your mental stamina and physical stamina and will make you dig deep to survive. And everyone says, why is SEAL training so hard? It's not because it's running on the beach or doing thousands of push-ups or pull-ups. It's when you have to spend hours and hours in the cold, cold Pacific Ocean and people give up. It's just too much for a lot of people to handle. And so Mario is exactly right. You have to understand what cold water does to you, not only physically, but, but mentally. And nobody, very few people understand that. Yeah, you, find, you find out when you get in it. Yeah. <laughs> So um, this, this kind of goes along um, the same thread, and I know both of you have, um, you know, a lot of experience on the training end, but also a lot of experience on the rescue end. What would you say is the most common accident type that you've responded to, or maybe the cause of those accidents that people could maybe avoid? I, 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 I'm, I'm the, the most common mishap in maritime, the most common mishap offshore that leads to tragedy mm -hmm. is leaving the boat. All right, if someone loses sight of you, so I don't care if it's a kayak or a windsurf, you know, you're windsurfing or paddle boarding or on a boat. If someone loses, if you go overboard with or without flotation and someone loses sight of you, there's a four in 10 chance you will not be seen again alive or dead. Wow. And you're probably going to die, but they'll find you. And so it is, it's the most dangerous mishap in maritime is leaving the boat. So, and, and that data comes from uh, the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, not the boating accident stats that don't count this, but the missile data for anyone that calls, uh, if, if you call the Coast Guard for help looking for somebody, there's a four in 10 chance they won't be found again alive or dead. And so uh, just going missing from your team, you know, being out there alone is the, is the most, put cold water to one side, the most dangerous thing to do is to be by yourself. Uh, and be un unoriented like you know I can be by myself I know you know offshore I mean I walk the beach in New Smyrna and there's a guy out there every morning who's going to do three miles down the beach he's got a little pull behind float thing just so he can have something to grab onto he's out there every morning by himself but he's you know he's not 50 yards off the beach he's fine but being out where you can't see anyone else and they can't see you is is the most uh, you've really got yourself into a risk picture that is, you're probably not going to get out of it. And that's a, that, so, you know, never swim alone, fine. Never boat alone, fine. Never boat with somebody who would let you be, not look at you. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's amazing. They just lost that fisherman who went out 300 miles offshore, fell off his boat and got lost. And just like clockwork, like you guessed it, they sent the message this morning, they suspended the search because they can't find them and that's it. And that happens every, every, I get a Google alert every day, Coast Guard suspends search. Oh, wow. Now you put, you, put, you put two Google alerts in your, in your email inbox, Coast Guard suspend search and Coast Guard medevacs. And then you find out exactly how much is going on out there where people are getting into trouble or never coming home. And it's, it's daily. Mario, yeah. on that same thread, do you think that people maybe rely too much on the Coast Guard's going to come rescue them if, if they get into a dangerous situation. Do you think that makes people, um, you know, we know that there are, you know, obviously rescue and response available for those types of uh, emergencies, but do you think people, you know, put too much weight in that the Coast Guard's going to get there in five minutes and be able to help them? I think the first problem is they, 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 they put too much weight in nothing's going to happen because nothing ever happens. That's what they put too much weight in. And then the one that makes that easy for them is, well, I'll just hit my e or, or call on the radio and get help, which is, you know, usually true. You know, usually does work. Um, uh, who was that girl? Uh, Abby Sunderland sailed around the world by herself. Youngest uh, uh, 
girl ever because she was 16. And the reason she was the youngest one ever, because 100 years ago, if you told your parents you were sailing around the world by yourself, they'd have tied you to a chair. <laughs> but, now, but she had three EPIRBs on her boat because they knew she could get help. But she almost, I mean, she came really close to getting dead anyway. And the rescuer, the, the fisherman that went in and got her almost didn't make it back. So it creates this, it's not that it's a false sense of security. It's just one part of the picture. Mm -hmm. Someone knowing where you are and that you're in trouble is one thing, but now, okay, are you in 40 foot seas or four? You know, how long is the wait going to be? What kind of shape are you in? You know, uh, the thing about the, the second thing that's un misunderstood about offshore, you know, the most dangerous, it's cold waters, number one. Number two is the distance. You know, if I get into trouble now and dial 911, in about seven minutes, there'll be a, a truck outside my door with a couple firefighter guys going to come in. I do that just 20 miles offshore, that turns into a couple hours before I'll get the guy in the suit with the EMT kit. And, and then if he needs to get me back, maybe it's another hour. You know, it all depends on the boat you're in and how fast they're moving. The, the, the helicopter doesn't even have to launch for half an hour if it's a helicopter case. And so, th you know, it takes distance equals time offshore a lot more than distance on land does, and that's not considered. So um, it's a l little bit of all of it. Um, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I just want to add something to Mario's. Um, you know, falling overboard, it seems to be a, a just like Mario mentioned, is the, the fisherman off of uh, Florida recently. And a lot of times the falling overboard um, event occurs because the person or persons are so focused on their task, whether it's re catching a fish or trying to re retrieve something that fell overboard or grabbing a line or yeah, whatever activity you're in, you get so focused on achieving the task that you put yourself in a situation where you end up falling overboard. And since a lot of our time is spent on land, where if you fall off the milk crate trying to reach for the upper shelf or you run out of gas, nothing dire is going to happen. You'll be embarrassed. And as Mar Mario said, you call 911 and the tow truck shows up and life goes on. But we, we transfer that mental mindset, unfortunately, to going out in the water, and we we continue these behavior behaviors that lead us down this road of when you do make a mistake, there is no recourse. You can't stand on the water and walk back to the boat. Um, so this tunnel focus of I got to get this task done eclipses thinking about the risk. And um, I just conclude with this little story. Years ago, I owned a sailboat, and I I did a couple of single-handed sails from the East Coast to Bermuda. And that's about a five day trip. I'm on the sailboat by myself. And, um, you know, I, my worst fear, like any single handed sailor was falling overboard when the autopilot's on, cause I knew I would die. Uh, the boat would sail on and I would be never heard from again. So I had a harness on hundred percent of the time. I never took it off. I had it on when I was down below. I was clipped in down below. I come in the cockpit and I stayed clipped in and I thought, I tried to think seven steps ahead. Oh, the wind's picking up. I'm going to reef the sail now. I'm going to do things proactively and not just focus on the immediate tasks, which then sometimes leads you into a domino effect of I'm now in big trouble and I've something's happened. So you got to change your thought process. Um, when you go, when you start involving water, you can't think like a land person anymore. Um, you got to get a mariner's perspective. Yeah. Um, I, I want to circle back and talk a little bit more about um, PFDs or, or life jackets. Um, you know, it, we've known about the, the safety surrounding life jackets for years and years. And I mean, I remember 15 years ago when I came into this world, you know, going through exercises of, you know, putting on your life jacket in water and understanding how difficult it was to put that life jacket on once you're in the water. Um, but I still see on social media, um, you know, in discussions I have, I, still a lot of questions surrounding PFDs, you know, who should wear them, what age, you know, is appropriate and what situation should they be worn, what types of vessels, what's the best type. So in your expert opinion, we, I, I'd like to just kind of talk about um, PFDs, their importance and what parents and equally professionals should know when they're advising um, voters on this. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to chime in just for, for parents first. If you're, if you're picking a life jacket for your child, um, while it's important that they kind of like it, 
that it's something they want to wear so you don't have to fight with them to put it on. Uh, it is, you have not shopped for it and you don't know you have the right one until you've put them on it and then walk them into the pool and let them go and see what it does. It can be approved or not. If it's Coast Guard approved, that, do, that doesn't mean it's the right one yet. Mm -hmm. that, we'll set that as a baseline. It's got to be Coast Guard approved. All right. And, but you have to understand the Coast Guard, while they do, while there is some subjective jump testing involved in the standard, the standard is primarily about materials. It's the right materials, it's enough buoyancy, it's this much foam, it's that kind of thread, it's that kind of webbing, and it's designed to do this to most people. And they have like the fifth percentile female and the 95th percentile male and then kids, you know, they have these different standards for the, for the labs to do the test, but they don't put your kid in it, right? And so you, how you find out how the life jacket will float you is to put the life jacket on and see how it will float you. And how you know that it's adjusted well is not that it's snug when you're sitting there, you know, in the house. Yeah, that's, that looks right. It's okay, jump into the water and see what that does because it, it might be different than you expect. And that's how you find out if it's the right gear, or if it's adjusted right, or, you know, do I want to tighten up the leg straps? Do I need to have leg straps or not? How high does this ride up on little Susie? Because you can, with the improperly sized life jacket, particularly on a child, if it rides up into their face when they jump in the water, you've triggered drowning probably. If it slides up and now the now their face is covered with the material and it's tight on them, and now they're that's it. They, they're not going to have the wherewithal to clear the device. It's not how that works with with, with toddlers, let's say. And so um, you've got to get them in the device, comfortable in the device, and comfortable in the device in the water. And then you know you got the right one. If you haven't had your child in their life jacket in a pool and watching them hang out for 10 minutes or so, you don't know if you got the right one. And I say 10 minutes because they might do great at first, but you realize that the reason they're great is because they're flexing and holding on to it. And then they say fatigue, they relax, and then you find out the water's right at their lips. And that Coast Guard approved PFD that you thought was fine. And so th that's my caution with children. And this applies to everybody, of course. It applies to any age. If you have a life jacket you like, particularly an inflatable, I've never, I've, I've taught a lot of survival classes just like Mike, I've never had a boater put on the life jacket they own that's inflatable, inflate it, get in the water for 15 minutes, they all get out and say the exact same thing. I gotta get another life jacket. I've never had someone go, man, I really love this thing. This was great, ever. Because you know, it was the first time they wore it. And so you, you have to wear it in the water. It, it's important that it's comfortable, sure, that it looks cool, fine. But until you float it in, in, a, in the water for 15, you know, if you really got some good time, spend 30 minutes in it, you'll know whether you want to spend any time in that thing or not. And if you haven't done it, you haven't tried your life jacket. Mm -hmm. The ones from West Marine, if I inflate a West Marine brand life jacket, inflatable life jacket on me, the, it chokes me and I can't breathe. I have to let air out to breathe. That's how badly that Coast Guard approved device fits me. So it's, so it's really a personal, personal fit issue. Do you have, um, between inflatable and non-inflatable life jackets, do you have a preference when it comes yes. to? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's subjective. For me, for me, a prof you know, as a professional rescue guy, and, and even now, who has access to a, an inflatables, I work where there's an inflatables maintenance area. And I have... 200 spare cylinders under the thing and I have all the the ways to maintain the different life jackets so I like inflatables because they're light and comfortable that I can I want to I can check out I can do a leak check on mine anytime I feel like it. okay you, if you're not in that environment you're not going to do a leak check on it you're going to look at the manual and go, okay, well, I kind of roughed it up on the period last week, but it's probably fine, and you're not going to leak check it. All right, so I like inflatables. If, I, if you don't have it, for anyone else but a pro who has access to that kind of maintenance, I like closed-cell foam because the closed-cell foam will never not float. It's going to float. It's, it's going to do what it does. And people that say, well, they're not comfortable, I'm like, yeah, you're kind of a wimp because it, every professional mariner who works on the water has to wear one. They work eight hours a day and they're doing really hard work, not sailing. 
and still they're fine, you know? And so I'm a, I'm a closed cell phone guy personally uh, for that reason. And I get a lot of pushback. Well, it's not enough newtons of buoyancy for offshore. And, okay, fine. You want 160 newtons of buoyancy or something? You want a big one? That's fine. It's meant to keep you alive longer. I'm like, that's great, but it better work or zero pounds of buoyancy. So there I said my piece. <laughs> So, I, I mean, I agree with Mario. I, I have an inflatable PFD that I wear. Actually, I bought from Mario. And I wear it all the time when I'm out on a boat, no matter what. And this is just me personally. But if I'm on the boat in a leadership position, meaning I'm the captain or the mate, or it's a dive boat, and so we're working on deck, I wear this inflatable PFD. And it, 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 I know it'll inflate because I maintain it. I've got a sideline light. I've got a perb I got stuff attached to it so if I go in the water I think my chances are going to be pretty good but if you don't want to go that route as Mario said you can get a type 3 or a work vest which if even if it doesn't give you a lot of buoyancy it gives you enough buoyancy to calm you down and keep you afloat so someone can come find you and people don't realize that without some buoyancy you can can't you cannot tread water very long and your whole focus is trying to stay afloat so you can't look for help or wave or do other things to assist you. So I think, I think that at least in my attitude is you should wear one all the time unless you're inside the bridge of the ship. Um, if you're out on deck doing a task, you should have a PFD on. And in the military, we had PFDs for all the crew, work vests. And if you're out on deck doing anything, you wore your work vest and it just became like wearing safety goggles or gloves or close toed shoes. You know, it's just, it's what you did. Um, I, one question I have, you know, we've obviously heard in the drowning prevention community for a long time, especially when it comes to life jackets that we see too many, you know, older, you know, children, teenagers, adults going out boating, being around open water and, you know, they say, well, I don't have to have my life jacket on me. You know, we've had um, a number of campaigns, um, you know, in the drowning prevention water safety community for a number of years that have been focused on increasing the usage of life jackets. You know, in your experience, have those campaigns been at all successful or are we still seeing the same problem reoccur where people just aren't wearing their life jackets and um, then they end up in the water and it's too late to put that on? Yeah, I, I don't know the data. Uh, I know it doesn't appear from the Coast Guard's data, but they don't get all the data, right? Mm -hmm. They don't get a, they don't they don't get all of it. Um, I, I don't. I, there's. I'm 53. I don't remember a time in my life where someone wasn't saying wear your life jacket. There wasn't a campaign of one kind or another. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't. I, I think uh, that's one of those generational change issues. It's just going to take a while. But, this is an opinion of mine that I happen to agree with. I, I think that's going to that that that's going to take the right set of mentors to to teach the younger kids to to come on board. You know, it's um, yeah, you know, it's the the generational change thing that 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 uh, Blake Collingsworth and Kathy doing the Josh the Otter thing. Like, I just teach the kids, and they'll nag the adults into believing it. Like, the first one who beat me up about seatbelts was my daughter, right? And so when she was four, you know. And so, and so I, I, I think if we can get the kids into it, then, then it'll change. But it, there's, there's a lot of stigma. I mean, the, the, there's a lot of, you know, and mostly, I'll be unfair for a second, but mostly men who think they, they don't need to do it. There's a little, there's a little, uh, and that's all, of, and it's all about past experience. It's all about never, having never gone overboard. I don't know a sailor, I know a lot of guys who we did find who did not wear life jackets who somehow miraculously were of the, you know, 35% that made it out or 20% that made it out. And they're wearing life jackets all the time now and they wouldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. They just weren't, ah, I don't need that. You know, you know, I, I know what I'm doing. And it's, it's not that you don't. It's that if, you know, it's this severity, probability, and exposure part. The severity of being wrong is you never go home. Over a 40 buck life fest in eight seconds of your time. And so, um, I don't, I don't know how to fix it. I, you know, again, put a Google alert on your Coast Guard suspend search. That might change your mind. Yeah. Yeah. I, 
You know, I, um, Adam, when I retired from the military, I, I started doing some teaching for um, couples that had bought boats, who had retired and bought boats and wanted to go cruising and enjoy life. And um, so and as part of teaching them how to handle their boats and do basic boating expeditions, I, I always recommended, I said, so, you know, I, if I were you, I'd get some inflatable PFDs to wear. And I, I thought people would go, oh, yeah, that's good advice. Yeah, yeah, I'd like getting a fire extinguisher or, you know, a smoke alarm or something. It makes common sense. You don't have to go on justifying it. But I found to my astonishment that many people, couples, families would go, oh, no, 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 that will give the perception of this being a dangerous activity or it won't, it'll take the fun out of it because we don't, we want this to be fun. And it was a whole different mindset. It's like using an electric drill without safety goggles, you know. I don't care if I put a metal filing in my eye because I, I just want to drill this hole right now. And so Mario's right. It's got to be a change in how you look at things and getting away from this. Everything's got to be fun and enjoyable with zero risk or I don't, I'm unwilling to accept that there might be some risk involved. Um, it's interesting. Years ago, there was a company, it's no longer in business, called Yacht Saver. And this tells you something about people's mental framework. Yacht Saver sold inflatable um, bags that would go in yachts and, or any boat. I had a CO2 bottle, um, like a you know, fiber extinguisher, carbon dioxide, with, but it expands many times uh, um, in cubic feet. So they would, Yacht Saver would say, hey, you can install these in your boat. And then if you have a, a leak, it'll keep your boat afloat. And Yacht Saver demonstrated how this would save your big, expensive, multi-million dollar boat. And people would not install them because they said, oh, no, no, that if I put it in, that means there's a possibility my boat might sink. And I don't want to deal with that thought. So I'd rather just buy my boat the way it is and just not, not think about that possibility. And it, I worked for them for a while. And it was really tough because you go to a, a boat show like Annapolis Boat Show with all these expensive yachts. And the one without the yacht saver, people would buy the one with, with the yacht saver, which is like putting another fire extinguisher on people would not buy that because they go, well, why do you have to have this on this boat? You're thinking this boat is going to sink. And so it changed the whole, instead of looking at it as a positive, people looked at it as a negative. So I really think you got to change it so people want to wear PFDs because it's, it's demonstrating that I can still have fun, I can enjoy it, and we're all going to live. But I don't know, in today's age, uh, that's a tough sell for some reason. So. It's one, Adam, Adam, I write a lot for... Well, I used to, because I stopped. I read a lot for like Soundings Magazine, Yachting Magazine, these boating magazines. And I would always, the, my first draft would always get kicked back because it would be a little too dark. And they're like, hey, we don't, you know, got to be careful what the safety articles in, yacht, in the Yachting Magazine because the advertisers, the guys who sell, want to sell boats, don't want to even talk about the perception of there being a hazard or a danger. You know, and so that was a, it's a whole different mentality, but that translates into, into just human nature. There's a certain, I don't want to talk about that. Right. So it, it's a tough one. So, you know, guys like Mike and I are so over the top the other way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I've, I've, I've been, I'm trying to take all the fun out of voting. I, no, I'm just trying to take all the bad times out of searching. I don't want to pull any more dead bodies out of the ocean. Holy. Yeah, so I'm trying to stop. So, yeah, help me out here. So yeah. it's just a diff different mindset. Um, so I, I know, uh, it, Michael, I think this was the best thing in your talking points because each of them had a pretty good description and there was one that um, was pretty much self-explanatory. And I'm just going to throw it out there and see if um, uh, there's any comments around this. Obviously, we know alcohol and boating is a big issue. Um, you know, do either of you want to speak to, you know, what, what you've seen over the years with alcohol and boating? Um, you know, has it been reduced? Um, you know, any of the incidents or any stories that you'd like to share with it? Yeah, okay, I'll do one. If that's all right, Mario, can I go first? Okay, so really quick. I, I think one, you have to set up your own parameters, your go, no go, and say, this is how I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna drink a beer when I get back to the dock. I'm gonna enjoy the day of safe boating because we'll go to the tiki bar once the boat's back on the trailer or tied up and share our sea stories. But if you're out on the water and you are in a, a responsible position, you're the skipper, the captain, or an adult, you have to say no alcohol. It's just that simple. And you, you just have to do that because one, 
as we've shown over and over and over and over again, even a small amount of alcohol diminishes your ability to think clearly, make proper decisions, uh, do a myriad of tasks. Plus, being on the water, you are dehydrated from the moment you get on that boat, you are dehydrated because unlike an indoor environment, you lose water out of your body so much faster due to wind, heat, and exposure that alcohol has a much more detrimental effect. So someone that sits in the air-conditioned bar and says, has a beer and goes, hey, I'm great, man, I'm in good shape. That is not the same as having a beer when you're out on a boat in the water. And so my, my little story is, uh, so anyway, my, I, I love having a cold beer or a nice glass of wine, but I love it when I'm sitting with Mario on his lanai after the day is over with, and I don't have to drive anywhere, and I don't have to do anything responsible anymore. I can just sit there and, and babble on until Mario tells me to shut up. So here's my little sea story. I worked, so in the, in the, in the military, there's no alcohol. You, you didn't have alcohol until you got back. That was a done deal. And even then, sometimes you didn't because maybe you'd be called up again or whatever. But here's my story. I worked for a small company when I first retired, and they, they got a client in once that wanted to do some training, and they wanted halfway through at lunchtime to stop and, you know, we'll go up to, to the tiki bar and we'll have a beer and a sandwich, and then we'll get back on the water. And I said to the guy who was managing the contract, I said, I'm not doing this. I said, I'm not going to be part of something. He said, but the clients love it. They're in Florida. You know, and I said, no, because if we have any problem whatsoever, we have people that cannot function at 100%. So you can't, to me, there's no gray area. It's one of these things where it's just like you're on the boat, you're drinking water, you're drinking lemonade, you're drinking Gatorade, no alcohol. And I've seen in Florida where on the weekends that terrible, awful stuff that happens when people go out the cooler full of beer and and think it's going to work and it you know sometimes they dodge the bullet but it's not worth it that is my little grant yeah. Go ahead. I, uh, yeah i'm a big fan of drinking <laughs> right, so that's a joke that's a joke i'm i'm a re i'm a realist there people are going to drink on, on boats and, and i don't particularly have a problem with it not as a leader, not if you're in a leadership position or a crew position. And that's the thing is how often are you not in that position is what you have, uh, you know, and, and what kind of boating are you doing? You, you know, it's, so Mike says never ever on a boat do you drink. Okay, I'm on the Cape May Ferry going across. Can I have a beer? Yeah, we're not talking about that. You know, you're on a, it, it, so I'm not really, I don't feel the need to prepare for the emergency uh, while I have an entire crew running the Cape May Ferry across or, um, uh, but on smaller recreational boats, you don't know what kind of situation you're going to end up with, your, you know, when you're going to be suddenly tasked. I can say Mike's driving a boat and I'm not, so I'm going to drink. But then when we run aground or throw a prop or someone goes overboard, now suddenly I'm in play as I need to be 100% and I'm not. And so it's a, it's a, it's a serious judgment call. It's like the always wear your life jacket. Yeah, okay, I believe it, always wear your life jacket. On the Staten Island Ferry, you done and one up, Mike? No. So, okay, so not always, always. So there, there's, there's too, again, there's too many variables to do absolutes. I think the, the, I think Mike hit on the most unaccounted for variable with alcohol and boating is that you have, you have the alcohol and you have the dehydration and you have the fatigue of just staying balanced on a boat at sea and you have the wind factor, which changes dehydration and the sun exposure, which does things to your eyes and everything else. And so there's this cumulative effect of all those things. Um, I personally can't stay awake for the beer at the Tiki bar after all day on the water because I'm too tired and going to bed, you know? So um, it, it, it's all, it's all different. I just like to, you know, I think the most dangerous thing with, boating in open water is the number of bars close to water. Right. Right. That's, <laughs> hey, I'm going swimming, you know, because they're hammered. Yeah. Uh, that, that's you know, I just, oh, sorry, Mario. I was going to just, yeah, I just read recently, it was just this past week, uh, news feed like Mario gets, I get these maritime news feeds. An Air Force major who was on a cruise ship drowned in a swimming pool on the cruise ship. And when his wife or the crew, yeah, I think it was his wife was, um, interviewed about it she said that they had both had 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 probably too much alcohol and they went for a swim in the pool and he drowned in the in the pool and so here's an example of like 
alcohol just le leading to a death on a, in a swimming pool. So I think we have to be, re alcohol deaths are they're thousands, um, tens of thousands every year because it's too much part of our society's rituals. And I, I think if you're involved in the water or boating, you've got to not succumb to what advertisement wants you to think, but to reality. If you want to live, you just got to say, is this a reasonable, prudent thing to be doing? We got any uh, questions? Because we're, we're, we're coming up on our hour. Is that, does anybody who's listening? I, uh, I, I, I haven't seen any audience questions yet, um, but I do have two additional questions that um, we'll see if anyone pops in from the audience. But um, these are, are kind of stepping away from boating and just talking about general open water safety. Um, you know, when you, when we talk about open water safety, you know, one of the things that I hear most often is rip currents, rip currents, rip currents. Mm -hmm. And I've heard from experts recently, especially in the, maybe the beach lifeguarding community who have said, maybe we need to start focusing on other risks in open water, not just rip currents. So do you agree or disagree with that? I mean, do you think we're, we're we need to expand what we're talking about in open water away from rip currents? Um, you know, obviously they need to stay central to the safety, you know, discussion, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that. I, listen, I, here's, what, here's what everyone does not do enough at the beach. Let's clear this up. I don't, I don't think we have to move towards or away from anything. I think everyone has to spend more time uh, talking to lifeguards. I have never been in a situation where you can walk up, because let me tell you who knows the beach in front of them, is, that, is the kid that watches it all day. And so I was at New Smyrna Beach. This was one an eye-opener for me. I was at New Smyrna Beach, and I just walk up to the guard, and I'm looking to film some rip currents, and I... And I don't see any, because I'm down there on the beach. And I look at the kid and stand and go, hey, how's the water day? And it's a pretty mild day. I goes, he goes, any ribs? And he goes, yeah, he points right out there. You see those two kids? They're about eight, 10 feet away from one. I got my eye on them, but there, there's a rip. You see that rip's been there? It's been there all morning, you know? And so that you can go, and I, and I got that from a story, but a guy, Lawrence Gonzalez, wrote a book called Deep Survival, and he was in Hawaii, and he walked, he went out to the beach to go swimming, walked past the guard and said, hey man, where's a good spot to swim? Like sort of like just joking. And he goes, well, you want to go in here. Don't go there. Because if you go in there, you're going to end up caught by that current, pulled out, then you'll be on the rocks and then both of us aren't going to make it out alive. Wow. And he's like, I was just kidding. Like, is there a good place to swim? I'm in Hawaii. And he goes, no. And so talking to the lifeguards first, if you're a parent with kids, and there's a lifeguard around. Go, hey, where do, where do you want me to have my kids? He's going to stay right in front of them, which is fine. And, that, and that's fine. But talk to him. Where are the risks? What's the problem today? Any jellyfish stings? Right? You can, you can drown. You can get pulled out to sea and they can drown in a rip current. They can also drown because they experience a jellyfish sting and are just at the edge of their capability. Uh, a, a jellyfish scrapes it. Listen, it's I don't know if you've ever been hit by not you don't have to it doesn't have to be a Portuguese man or just your standard open you know just a jelly with you get stung on the leg by a jellyfish it might just take out your whole left side to pain and grabbing it you know and so you want to know if there's jellies in the area there's you know they have the, the flag systems at some beaches you see a purple flag that means there's some marine life problem it's either jellyfish or it's rarely sharks but it's jellyfish or 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 uh, stingrays you know. And, and all those stingrays can cause drowning, right? Because you're up to your water here, you get stung, now your feet are up, and now you're in deep water. And jellyfish do the same thing. Uh, and, and so it's not about taking the conversation, I think, away from one thing or another. I, I'd like to see a conversation about, besides swimming on guarded beaches, talking to the lifeguard. Like before you go, you gotta walk by the stand anyway. Hey, what do you want me to know today? Because the guys like at Hope Sound Beach here in Florida, they're like, hey, a good guard's a dry guard. And they spend most of their time talking to the thing. And they walk around. The older lifeguards will walk the beach and look at their risk, high-risk swimmers and go, hey, watch out for this, watch out for this. And they end up, you know, staying in the stand that way. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to add. To yeah, go ahead. Models. Yeah. So when you see diagrams of rip currents, that are used for educational purposes, like on the placard at the beach or on a brochure. It always shows the rip current dynamics looking down from above, this aerial view of 
how it flows out. And, but when you're, as Mario said, when you're a person standing on the beach, looking at it horizontally, you cannot see rip currents. They're, they're invisible unless you're a lifeguard in a tower or you've, as Mario said, you've been there your whole life and you can detect subtleties. But most people don't understand, who get into trouble, don't understand rip currents because they look out and they go, all I see is the ocean and some waves. And then when they do go into the water and they get in the rip current, they try and fight it, which, you know, now we're in this don't fight it. But people don't think, they don't understand that they're fighting it because they, they have this vision that they can actually swim against the current. But a one knot, you cannot swim against a one knot current. A one knot current is the maximum current that someone in really good shape can probably stem. But even a very small quarter or half knot current, you, you'll exhaust yourself in minutes trying to swim against that. But people don't comprehend that. They think, oh, I can, I can swim against it. And then that's where they get into trouble. So one is we, we don't understand the dynamics of currents. We can't see them. And it's an enigma. And that's why we keep going in, getting sucked out to sea. We try and swim against it. We get exhausted. Our head goes under water. So I, I, I agree with Mario. You, you need to understand that dynamics. Realize you cannot see it. Talk to the lifeguards. If you have any doubts, then, you know, um, uh, don't go in until you figure out what the, what the situation is. I just want to point out that Michael's always agreed with me. <laughs> <laughs> You must really like you, Mario. I think we just agreed um, once, but I can't remember. <laughs> uh, well, we are coming up on the end of our time. Um, is there anything, any, any questions or anything you two would like to share with our audience, um, whether they're watching live now or who will watch the recording later, that you, know, you really wanted to say today that we didn't get a chance to discuss? Well, I'd throw something out. Um, of course you would. Yeah, so I'm a big fan of checklists. And I don't think checklists are the end all or be all or that checklist will solve all your problems. But I think when you take the time to write down items of concern. So when I say a checklist, it's like making a shopping list. If you're going to the beach, for example, and you're concerned about your family safety, you should write things down. Check the weather. Where's the wind from? What's this go? You know, there's so much weather data on the internet these days. There's so many places to get to say to yourself, do I have life jackets for my kids? Which beach am I going to? Do I know the emergency number? Just write down a list of things that jump into your mind and don't do it while you're getting into the car. Do it on Monday before the weekend and then get your mind thinking. And because as soon as you start thinking about things, you'll end up putting more things on your list. Oh yeah, I got to do this. Oh yeah, I got to do that. Uh, and then I think it'll focus you on maybe solving problems before they end up becoming life-threatening. And so always have a pad of paper, have a notebook, write stuff down, get your head in the game. So we so used to say in the Army, before you go do something, get your head in the game, think about it, focus on it, figure out what you're really doing. That's great advice. I agree with Mike. No, really? <laughs> <laughs> Wow, had the tables turned there at the end. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we'll we'll end it here then. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. I, this has been an incredible discussion. I uh, exceeded my expectations, and thank you for sharing your expertise with our audience. Um, thank you for everyone at home for joining us, um, and thanks to again D and D Technologies for sponsoring today's webinar. We have another webinar scheduled for July 3rd at one o'clock Eastern time. The topic for that is gonna be community-based water safety initiatives. And we'll have uh, four panelists, Blake Collingsworth with Joshua Collingsworth Memorial Foundation, um, uh, Pam Canal with Fort Worth Drowning Prevention Coalition, um, Paula DiGregoli, um with uh, NCH uh, Safe and Healthy Children's Coalition in Naples, and uh, then Alyssa Magrum with Collins Hope, all discussing their community-based water safety initiatives and hopefully uh, educating our audience on um, what's worked and what hasn't worked for them. And then we have a really exciting webinar scheduled for July 17th, which is gonna talk about federal and state legislation. We have some gentlemen from New Jersey who's pushing uh, their new bill to uh, put water safety into schools and uh, an NDPA favorite, Alan Korn, will be joining us to discuss the Virginia Graham-Baker Act and the federal legislation process. Um, but until then, again, thank
thank you gentlemen for joining us. Thanks to you all at home and uh, hope you guys have a great uh, rest of the day and a safe uh, summer season. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Mario. All right, see you next time, fellas. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye.